Well, thank you very much. That's uh, that's a first. We are so glad to be home, as somebody just said. This is a great place and forever holds memories in our heart. And we're glad to be here this morning. Even if it's only 45 minutes away, it still seems like we don't get here enough. I look across and I see faces. You're all smiling at me because, well, I don't know why you're smiling at me. (laughs) It's encouraging today to see you, to see this, because we're not quite here yet, but it's something to look to. I remember when this wasn't this, and um, we're very excited to be here today. Before I get into the Word, though, I do want to take a, just a brief moment today and give honor. I'm sure I'm not the first that will say this, and I hope not, but by chance, if it's been a little while since you've heard this, I want to honor you today. And the reason I say that is, is because you unselfishly share your pastor just like today. It would be much better for you if he was here than me. But you don't complain. I hope you don't complain. You're blessed today because you give. And there is a whole host of pastors and pastor's wives that are forever grateful to you today as the church of New Life in Cabot because you share your pastor and and his wife. And so I just want to thank you today. I understand what kind of a sacrifice that is. And, uh, And I do want to give honor to my pastor, both of them. I told Sister Gaddy a long time ago, I said, Sister Gaddy, when we were doing rose cells, anybody remember that? Oh, thank God that's done with. I wanted to be close to the Gaddies, and so I offered my undying service to Rose Cells, only to find out that Pastor has such a unique way of bringing you in and then getting away and letting you do it all. I remember one early morning, it was the two of them there and myself, and I said, Sister Gaddy, in case you don't know, anytime I get out of line, you better tell me. And put me in my place. And so I honor both of my pastors today. And I am so happy to be here with all of you, friends. And um, I'm excited today. Aren't you? How many believe God's going to do something great in this place? Amen. Praise God. My wife was baptized and received the Holy Ghost in the Nexus room over there. In case you don't know me, I want you to understand how deeply connected I am to this church. We're eternally grateful for New Life of Cabot. And you are blessed by your pastor and the people you have, but you're also blessed to have my wonderful mother. This is one thing I won't forgive you for. You keep her. (laughs) She's a wonderful lady. And uh, I can't thank her enough for that. But most importantly, I want to recognize and give honor to my wife because she's the spiritual one of the bunch. And so when I say something incorrect today, uh, don't blame it on her. (laughs) My wonderful kids, Macy and Raylan, they're with us too. Amen. How many are ready to get in the Word this morning? Thank you, Brother Nate, for such a Smith, for such a good time this morning. I appreciate that. If you have your Bibles, would you turn to Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 15. I'm just going to read one verse of scripture for now and then we'll look at the whole context of this shortly. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 15. Man, if this is your first time here, you have found the best church in Cabot. Hands down. If you were thinking about going to another church, don't bother. Let's just make this your home church today. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 15. Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints. Now this is Paul talking to the church at Ephesus. 
and he said, I've got word or word's been sent to me. I've been noticing and there's two things that I've noticed. One, I've noticed your faith in the Lord. And then the second thing I noticed is your love unto all the saints. I've come to preach a message this morning that I believe God's given me, especially for this church. I haven't even tried it out on my church yet. And so, if you will just allow me for a moment, I just want to talk to you about love and the church. Love and the church. Amen. Could we pray one more time and just ask that God would do His perfect will this morning here in Cabot. Lord, we give you praise today. For it, Before anything else happens, God, we give you praise right now. We thank you for your spirit that's in this place. We thank you for every life that's in this place. And it's by no accident this morning, God, I'm asking that you take your perfect word, your infallible word, your word that has no mistake and no error, and you put it into our lives today, God, and that it grows in us today, and it changes us. Everyone said amen. 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 How about some love quotes this morning? Here's a quote for you today. I think, guys, you can help me. I don't know who wrote this. Love is when you can't fall asleep because reality is finally better than your dreams. Says no mother of a newborn child. (laughs) How's this? The next one. Spending time with you is so precious that I love every minute that we are together. Says no one married past one month. I love you, babe. Here we go. Billy Bob said this. When I hold you in my arms, I feel like I'm holding the whole world. Billy Bob, rest in rest hills just down the road. And the last one. Our love is all I will ever need. And you to make dinner and mow the grass and get a job and pick up your clothes from off the floor. It's safe to say today that our world may have just a little bit misconstrued idea of what love actually is. It wasn't very many years ago. In fact, it was in 2010 and we were married for all of one whole year and I had marriage figured out. So much that, so much that in our first year of marriage... We went to a home friendship group at Brother Jim Nidge's house on how to be married and how to keep being married. We went to a marriage retreat that my pastor offered to pay for me to go to. <laughs> but man, we had this thing figured out, I'm telling you. And being a good husband, I decided that after dragging my wife 900 miles away from her family, I better take her home to see mom and dad. And so we went and we seen a lot of the family and, and, and we got into that frozen tundra of northern Wisconsin and we were greeted by temperatures that you can only imagine. And lots of cheese. An insane amount of cheese. And while the cheese was amazing, people in Wisconsin know nothing about seasoning. I don't believe that salt and pepper exist. In northern Wisconsin. I remember telling Melissa after about the third day, I said, I need something rolled in flour and salt and pepper (laughs) with some Tony Satchery sprinkled all just a little bit. If something doesn't happen, I'm going to the grocery store and I'm gonna open my mouth and just pour cavenders down it. And then it was like the windows of heaven opened up and I heard we were having roast that night. And oh, the joy that flooded my soul. Because I realized finally something that I could identify with. A good roast with potatoes and onions and mushrooms and gravy smeared all over it. So you can imagine my dismay when we sat at the table... And out of a big stock pot of boiling water, they pulled out a 
piece of meat and said dinner is served. I almost cried that day <laughs> over food. Here's the problem though. It was roast. And it, it had a very slight resemblance of roast. And on a, on a very minuscule scale, it smelt something like roast. And as bad as I have to admit it, on the very lowest scale, there was a very faint taste of roast. But it was not roast. Like grandma made roast, like roast was intended to be. And so is something else. When you read through the Bible and especially the life of Jesus, you'll notice one word that happens almost on every occasion. Somehow, some way, Jesus always finds a way to intertwine this word, love, into his messages. Love. Love for one another. Love for God. Love for your enemy. Love for your neighbor. Love for those that do good and love for those that don't do good. Love one another. So love and unity in the church is normally present. But my question this morning, is it always the way God intended it to be? Has it somehow maybe lost its flavor? For you see, the church is only as strong as its love for one another. In, in other words, you know, I've been to churches, uh, I've been to churches where you could tell that they, quote, liked each other, but they didn't love each other. And you take a church that can't love one another, and it's not long before so and so is going to leave here, and so and so is going to quit going here, and, and before you know it, you don't have a church at all when there's no love. A church is only as strong as its ability to look at one another and say, hey, we may have a little bit of differences, we may not do things just the same way, but you know what? I love you regardless because my, my love for you is not about who you are, it's about what we share in common. So in the natural, the church is only as strong as its love for one another. But it doesn't stop there. The power of God working in the church is only as strong as our love for one another. Because here's the deal. You can't pray for somebody that you don't love. Try it sometime. Think of somebody you don't love and start praying for them. Watch the word. Yeah. It's not easy to pray for somebody that you don't love. Therefore, it's not easy to operate in the giftings of God around people you don't love and don't care about. The power of God in the church here at New Life of Cabot is only as strong as your love for one another. Let me help you with that this morning because there is such a need today, not just for words of when we leave and we shake hands and say, it's good to see you, I love you, but there has to be a deep-rooted love in the church today. So let's look at our text here in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 15. He said, I've noticed, I've heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love unto all the saints. So I cease not to give thanks for you and then making mention of you in my prayers. When Paul hears these two things are present in the church, he said, you've got faith. And, and we all know that because the Bible says without faith it's impossible to please God. So we, we have no problem having faith. But that next part, he says that you have love for one another. It activates a prayer in Paul. He puts it like this. He said, I've been to other churches. I've been to different places and I haven't found this yet. And so because you're here, I want to pray a prayer over you. Now, I have to admit to you today that there are times that I get wowed by the Lord. It's pretty much any time I open the Bible. And, and, and when I began to read this, I thought to myself, 
Lord, is this happening in our church? Could you honestly grant this prayer in our church? Paul says, because you have faith and because your love for one another is evident, I'm going to pray a prayer over you today. And this is what he begins to pray. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, in verse 17, the Father of glory may give unto you the spirit of wisdom. Anybody need to be a little wiser today? And the revelation and the knowledge of Him. Anybody need to know a little bit more about the deepness of God? Because, because today you have faith and because you have love, I'm going to open up your understanding a little bit. I'm going to begin to impart to you some things. And he goes on and he says this, that the eyes of your understanding be enlightened, that you may know the hope of His calling i got other things I want to get to this morning, so I can't stay here too long. But there is a call, I believe this emphatically, the Lord showed me this not too long ago. There is a call for an individual, but then there's a call for the church. And every church doesn't have the same call. I know the mission is is to reach the world and, and propagate the gospel. But each church plays a different role in a statewide and then in a national level to providing that hope of calling. And so, so many times we pray that God would give us a revelation of what our calling is. God would give us, you know what, hey, I'm at home, I can say this. You know what my pastor told me one time? You want to know what the will of God is? Get in the church where God's blessing and you're in the will of God. I said, oh, pastor, I got I to gotta know. I went to him, I was in that little office. I said, pastor, I got to know today. What's, what's the call? What's my call in life? I want to make sure I'm doing everything that God's got for me to do. He said, get involved in the church and you'll be on the will of God. If you're looking for something and you're wanting to know what the will of God is, find something that's reaching people in this church and get involved in it. And you'll be in the will of God. But beyond that, the church has a calling today. And Paul said, because you love one another and because your faith, God's going to be re- begin to reveal to you the hope of this calling. And what are the riches of the glory, of the inheritance of His saints that He's reserved for them today. You'll begin to see the things that God has saved for this church today. Let me ask you a question just for help to make sure I'm, I'm, I'm preaching to the right church. Does anybody believe that New Life of Cabot has reached its maximum potential yet? No. God has a treasure of things that's reserved for this church. It's, if you want to put it, it's a treasure chest of spiritual riches that far surpass any monetary value. The things, the deep places, the deep things of God that He's opened for a church that knows how to love one another today. And if it wasn't enough, He gets to the next verse in verse 19 and He said, What is the exceeding? This is what's going to happen. This is the prayer I'm praying over the church. This is what's expected in New Life of Cabot. The exceeding greatness of His power towards us who believe according to the working of His mighty power. Beyond what you can do and achieve in the natural, God said, I'm going to open up things in the supernatural. The Holy Ghost within you shall endure you with power from on high. There are things that are going to happen in the power of God because your love. Amen. You have to understand today that Paul's not just simply a little excited. He's finally found a church. He's he scourged through Corinth and, and all of the other churches and he's finally found somebody that's linked their faith with their love for the saints. And it moves him to such a place that he, he says, I've got to open up another avenue of prayer just for you. 
Paul says, I don't, I don't want you to just believe in this power of God working for, for you, but you have to understand today that the power of God works in you. I, I got all these rabbit holes today to chase down. One of the biggest lies of the enemy today is that you don't have enough Holy Ghost in you for miraculous things to happen. One of the biggest lies of the enemy today would be this, that you've got the same Holy Ghost, you just don't have as much as the prayer team or the pastoral team, or because you've only been doing this for a month or a year, that you have to graduate to a place where the exceeding greatness of His power works in you. That is just a lie. And the quicker you realize that, the quicker you'll start making a difference in the lives of people around you. That moment when God filled you with His Spirit, you immediately began the exceeding greatness of His power in your life. I believe that today. I don't believe you have to go to Bible school and I thank God for purposes. I tell you, I'm intertwined with this church. I did four years of Purpose Institute here. I don't believe you have to go to Purpose Institute or to any other Bible college or set so long before you can lay your hands on somebody and pray a prayer of healing and watch them in your workplace. That's the exceeding greatness of His power. When you look at the context of what Paul says, if you got that next verse, just pop it up there real quick. That this is the same power. The power that raised up Christ from the grave. This wasn't just the spit and mud power. This wasn't just the touch the leper power. This was the raise up the dead and bring them back to life kind of power. That's the same great power that's in the church. But are you ready for this? It only happens if you've got faith and if you've got love. Okay? We don't, we don't teach that in Bible school very often. Look at the ministry and the life of Jesus. He loved others. When he was tired, when he felt used, when they just showed up for a miracle, the Bible says he's moved with compassion. He loves them. When the woman comes to him that used the literally body that he created for her own self-gain and things that defile the creation, yet still he loves. Over and over again, he extends mercy and love regardless of the person he really genuinely loves people. And Paul says, Ephesus, you've got the same kind of love. And not only do you have the same kind of love, but you have the same spirit working in you. And you got it. And it's working because you love one another. I've come to plead with someone this morning in the Holy Ghost. If there's any anguish, if there's any strife, let it not be named of this church. If only you knew today the power of God that works in you. If only you knew today the spiritual blessings that rest upon this church. You would never allow yourself to not have love for one another because you would want the exceeding greatness of His power today. It is happening and the Holy Ghost today is speaking this. Love one another. Let it be said of this church amongst this city, they really love one another. Jesus points this out this morning in John or in Mark chapter 12. I I, I was reading this, in fact, we were doing a class. And Maumel, and I appreciate our church today, uh, they don't complain when I leave. And so I, I'm, I'm appreciative of that. At least I don't think they complain. But in Mark chapter 12, uh, Jesus is, is, is talking here and, and they're giving an account of some things that's happening. And when you read through this, 
you're going to find out about the love of Jesus because the Pharisees are trying to trip him up. They're trying to find fault with him. And one of the scribes that's kind of amongst that group, having heard them reasoning together, perceiving that he had answered them well, asked Jesus, which is the first commandment of all? Are you ready for this? Here's the first commandment. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Period. That's the first commandment. You don't have to read anything else. That's it. Make sure you get that. That's the first. If you ever wanted to be like Jesus, then Jesus says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And then you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second, like it is this, that you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Now let me tell you something about that scripture. You can't love your neighbor like yourself. Unless you love yourself. <laughs> Here's what's happening. Too many people are getting married trying to love one another and they don't even like themselves. And then they get in marriage and they can't figure out why their marriage isn't working. It's because they don't even like themselves. Jesus says, if you really love me with everything inside of you, then you're going to love your neighbor like you love yourself. So if you treat your neighbor bad, then you don't like yourself. If you got problems with people in the church, then you don't love yourself. If you're calling, I don't know what's going on. I'm going to get in trouble for this when he watches this live stream. Somebody throw something at me if I get out of line. If you're always contentious about things that's going on in the church then the problem's probably not the church. The problem is probably the way I feel about myself. And the Holy Ghost is keeping me uneasy. And the quicker I began to repent and get myself under control, the quicker I can love somebody else the way Jesus intends. Watch this today. And so this man looks at Jesus and he said, Well said, teacher. Well, no duh, he's God. You have spoken the truth for there is one God and there's no other but he and to love him with all thy heart with all thy understanding with all thy soul and with all thy strength and to love one's neighbor as his self as oneself is more than all of the burnt offerings this man was saying that everything that has been done from the very first offering up until now does not compare to understanding that there's one God and that everything I have belongs to Him and that I'm going to love like He loves. Period. No, All that Solomon did, all of the sacrifices for the thousands of years couldn't equal this understanding. And then watch this. I've never really quite put this together. Jesus tells him right after that, when Jesus saw that He answers wisely... He said unto him, you're not far from the kingdom of God. Okay, I'll admit, that was like a moment for me. What do you mean? They hadn't been baptized yet. They hadn't been filled with the Holy Ghost yet. They didn't have white shirts and suits and, and they, they didn't have tithing figured out yet. They, what do you mean they're not far from the kingdom of God? When you know and you understand that there's one God and beside Him there's none. And when you begin to love people, God says you're real close to all of the things that I've prepared for eternity. You're getting real close. Can I tell you something today? So many times we give a lot of people bad raps because they haven't got what we got. Just, I'm no, but hear me out. 
because they don't belong to this or because they haven't had this experience, because they haven't come to the fullness of truth yet. But I'm going to tell you something. Don't discredit how close they are to the kingdom of God. Instead, just love them and say, hey, I know where you are and I want to help you get to where the fullness of this is. Because there's an understanding that when you really love, God says, this is close to my heart. This is why Paul said, I'm going to pray that God opens up the treasures, the riches of His glory, because you have love for one another. I was studying this out. And, and, and I read that immediately. Immediately the Holy Ghost quickened my heart and it went right to John chapter 3. And verse 3 through 5 when Jesus is talking with Nicodemus and He said, unless a man's born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So here's the reality. You can get really close to the kingdom of God. Don't, don't, don't mistake me. You can love until you've got nothing left to love with. But that doesn't get you into heaven. That gets you really close. But if you want to see heaven, and if you want to enter heaven, the Bible, Jesus says, not the Bible, Jesus just says, unless a man's born of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And so what does it take today? You You mean I can't just by loving somebody? No, you can't. But I'm going to also tell you, I don't care how many times you got baptized. It doesn't matter how many times you spoke in tongue. If you don't have love in your heart, you may be able to see it. You may get in there for a moment. But there's a judgment coming. There's got to have love in the heart today. This is the reality of all of it today, folks. If the church will ever learn to really love one another, then the possibilities of what God can do through His power working in us is endless. endless Praise God. Romans chapter 12, verse 10. I'm hurrying. Let me give you a little bit of application this morning. We were on a we started a two week prayer and, and that Monday night when Pastor texted me was our first prayer uh, night of our fasting, prayer and fasting. And I went in with all this intention just to hear from God. And uh, and that day Pastor texted me and said, Hey, could you preach? I said, Sure, I'd love to. And immediately that night the Lord began giving me some things. For today. Here's the reality this morning. And in Romans 12 10, he says, Be kindly affectionate one to another with brotherly love, in honor, preferring one another. Now, here's how I read that you got to do something. You cannot be kindly affectionate one to another without doing something. And you sure can't prefer one another without there being some kind of application. I fear that mere words today have become the sole authority of our love or the sole expression of our love. How many of you wonderful men know that you can say I love you a hundred times But if you don't ever put your arms around her, she's not going to believe you love her. No? Okay. (laughs) All the women are saying amen. What's wrong with you men? (laughs) You can say I love you all you want. But if you don't ever show it, there's no real love there. Be kindly affectionate. and And then preferring, giving preference to one another. You know what that means today? That means if two of you, it just... This is what comes to my mind. But if two of you both own a construction business and somebody in the church asks one of you to do some work, you should say no. I'm just kidding. (laughs) The other guy doesn't get mad because they asked so-and-so to do it. In fact, he's happy. I'm glad my brother got the job. That's preferring one another. 
it'd be as if the two of you seen a hundred dollar bill laying out on the road and you locked eyes and you both seen it at the same time. Instead of a dog fight to get to it, you look at each other and you say, hey man, go ahead. I'm good. That's preferring one another. I would rather see your success than mine if I made $100,000 this year. God, let it be in the name of Jesus. I hope you make $200,000 this year. That's preferring one another. Not, man, if he can make two hundred, dollars Lord, you ought to give me at least that. This is preferring one another. When we get the focus off of us, because here's the deal, all of us would love to make that money. That's your loving yourself. You're wanting it for yourself. You begin to love somebody else the same way, preferring one another, being affectionate to one another. And Jesus says, this is how people will know that you belong to me. Because they can see your love for one another. Let me ask it to you like this, and and, and I'm really getting close here. I'm not trying to bring back the holy kiss, okay? Don't do that. I'm talking about helping one another. Preferring one another. And most sincerely praying for each other. Not just when the Facebook message comes across, Oh, I'm sick. Oh, I don't feel good. Oh, such and such happened. And then we click the little praying hands. I mean we really pray for one another. We pray that God's blessings and favor is upon our brothers and our sisters. Let me ask it to you like this. When's the last time you prayed for... Don't raise your hand. But when's the last time you prayed for somebody in the church? Get it in your mind. You got it? Were they sick? When's the last time you just knelt down and thought, you know what, I really love the Leonards. Lord, I'm going to take my time with you today, and I'm going to spend it praying that God just blesses everything about their life. God touches their children. God touches their finances. I'm just going to spend time praying for the Leonards today. Now, I'm not saying you don't do that, but how many times do we actually love our brothers and our sisters enough? Spend time praying for them. In fact, today you could probably count on one hand how many people are regularly praying for you. Think about this. I I looked across our church several weeks ago and I said this statement. Most of them, most of the people in our church, their parents, our grandparents don't serve the Lord. Or they're at an age where their parents and grandparents uh, don't have the option of serving the Lord anymore, if you get what I mean. They've passed on. And the thought occurred to me, Brother Smith, who's praying for them? Because the Bible says that day in and day out, with no sleep and no rest, the enemy's walking around looking for somebody to tear apart and devour and depress and confuse and steal away. So who's praying for them? If the church doesn't pray for one another, then the church has no... The church is praying for the lost. The church is praying for those that are being blinded. But who's praying for the church? Paul says, I've noticed your love for one another. You're doing things that go beyond just words. You're praying, you're fasting, you're really preferring one another. What would happen today if the 200 plus people of New Life Cabot started on a regular basis calling out every name? God, use them for your purpose, Lord. Name by name and person by person started calling out for them to be a witness. When the church really loves, the church really prays for one another. Would you stand with me this morning? The love and the church today. Faith, you got to have it. You got to have it. But love, it's equally important today. Fine, how do we do that? 
How do we love? How do we really love? Well, here's the bad news. You can't. You can't within your own flesh. Watch what happens. Jesus spends three plus years of his life here on earth. And he's got these 12 disciples. And if you just kind of look with an open mind, you see this kind of stuff. Uh, Lord, did you see the new kind of car Peter bought? Who does he think he is? Hey, Mom, would you go ask Jesus who's going to be uh, first up there and maybe see if he'd give us a... I-, I can't believe they would do that. John drank a little too much extra of the grape juice. Lord, you see that? They're, they're always just wanting to just be a little bit better than the other. It's a fight to get to see who's going to sit by Jesus. And then to make matters worse, when Jesus dies, whoo, they're gone. They didn't even have enough love for one another to stay together. And word comes, Jesus is here. Jesus is arisen. He's alive. And they get together. And, and it's all joyful again. And then Jesus says, I'm leaving. But go and wait. Now let me ask you a question. What do you think gave them the ability to stay together in that upper room? They prayed together. Because the truth is, is every other time that they're alone, they scatter. But this time's different. They pray together. And then what happens? The Holy Ghost comes and and God fills them with the Holy Ghost and it's wonderful. But from that moment on, they start loving one another. They don't care who's first. They just care that the lost has the gospel preached to them. They don't care what church you go to or who was the first one to perform a miracle or or who who did this. In fact, it says that they had all things in common. Love happens when they're filled with the Spirit of God. How do I love people today, preacher? You love God because the Spirit inside of you gives you the ability to love. In fact, he loves so much. The Bible says that greater love had this than no man that a man would lay down his life for his friend. And that's exactly what Jesus did. He exemplified the greatest love of all. It wasn't just, I love you. It wasn't just a a mere miracle that took something from you or touched you for a moment. But he literally gave his love with his life. But he doesn't stop there. He says, I'll, 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 not only do I love you enough to die for you and forgive you of sins. I love this day. I'll give you a way to have all those sins taken away from you. If we're going to talk about love, salvation's the greatest love example of all today. If you've never been baptized in the name of Jesus... That is the greatest feeling of love is when you go in one way and you come out and you are so clean and you are so pure and you feel so free. And God says, I love you so much. I'm not just going to forgive you of your sins, but I'm going to give you a way to wash all of that sin out of your life. Thank you, Brother Smith, because the power of the word that he said this morning doesn't just work for the here and now, but it goes into the past and it wipes all of that away. But it doesn't stop there. So now you're forgiven and now your sins is gone, but I love you this much. I'm going to take a part of my spirit because I don't want you to be alone. We're talking about how we ought to love each other. This is how Jesus says you ought to love. You ought to love each other enough that you'll take part of you to help somebody else. You'll never leave a brother or a sister alone. Even when they call you to move. He said, I'm not going to leave you alone, but I'm going to give you my spirit. And when that happens, you'll forever, forever, 
be a part of me. My point today is, is very simple. Regardless of where we are and what point of life we're in, love has to be our focus. Yes, we want to reach the lost. Yes, we're, we're going to build this building. I can't wait to see that. But in the meantime, we're not going to get sidetracked. Or we're not going to get turned by the things that the enemy would try to convince us. But yet we're going to stay in unity and in love. We're going to prefer one another. And so this is just my, my plea to this church today. As a church. Love. If, if, if everybody says of new life, well, they didn't build their building big enough or, or they don't have this or, 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 man, I wish they'd get a new guy to play the piano. <laughs> he knows better than that. If all of Cabot thinks that there's issues with this church, let it be, but let one thing ring out through all the city. Those people love like Jesus loved. And in doing so, you will be such an attractant to this city. But it can't just be words. It's got to be an action. I don't know what it is for you. You know, maybe it's, maybe it's start and celebrate recoveries. Or maybe it's being a part of a, of a, of a widow group. Or whatever the case is. But somewhere, you've got to start showing that love. But you can't love somebody if you don't love yourself. And you can't love somebody if you got a fence against them today. And so this is just how I feel about it. I, I, I don't know what's typical, but I wish we'd just all kind of start pressing in a little bit. And you may have to, you may have to before you leave today, you may have to go get a hold of a brother or a sister and say, look, Listen, I've done this. I know I'm a preacher and I'm not supposed to say this stuff. But I've, I've had bad feelings towards people that's went on for years. And I had to go to them and, and get in front of them and cry and say, I'm sorry. It was wrong of me. And so maybe before the days, you don't have to do that right now. But maybe before the day's over with, you need to do that. But right now, this is what I wish we would do. I wish we would link up with somebody. And let the word of God today that was just spoken become alive in us today why don't you find somebody if it's if it's not your spouse don't pray with your spouse find somebody else if you can and begin to pray for them everything that you've wanted for yourself begin to pray for them today god would you bless them today would you use them in ways that they didn't know that they could be used today would you reveal yourself to them today god Come on, if they don't have the Holy God, would you fill them with your spirit? Just like you did with the disciples in the book of Acts today, Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, the gates of hell can't stand against the church that's unified and loves one another. Come on, I love you today. I'm praying the blessings and the favor of God on you today. I don't have anything against you. Oh, that's beautiful. How beautiful it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Come on, I prefer you. I want the best for you. 
Hallelujah. Praise God. I, I want to do something that I feel in the Holy Ghost today because I felt like before I came that God was going to fill somebody with the Holy Ghost today. I just have a couple of hands that will agree to that this morning. If you've never received the gift of the Holy Ghost, it's just that. It's a gift. I'm going to tell you something else. God opened my eyes this morning in prayer. The reason some people don't get the Holy Ghost is because they've got bitterness in their heart. They've asked God to forgive them of sins, but they haven't wanted to forgive other people. Think about that. But I believe God wants to fill somebody with the Holy Ghost. And you know what the beauty is? You're in a group and a room full of people that once didn't have the Holy Ghost. Everybody here got it. If you've never received the gift of the Holy Ghost like they did in the book of Acts, that's for you today. It doesn't stop at repentance. If you've never been baptized in the name of Jesus in water, that's for you today. It doesn't just stop at repentance. God wants to take all of that sin, wash it out today. And so in just a minute, they're going to sing again. If that's you, you don't even have to do anything else but just lean over to someone next to you and say, I want what he's talking about. It's the love of God in a tangible form. You'll literally feel different. You'll literally experience God. It's his love. That's what the Holy Ghost is. It's his spirit in you. And so as they begin to sing this song, if that's you today, just look at somebody that you're with or somebody that's standing next to you and say, I'd like to receive the Holy Ghost. I'd like to be baptized in Jesus' name. And they'll pray with you and God will do just that in your life today. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's pray together. Lord, let it be right now. In the name of Jesus. If you need the Holy Ghost, just tell them. I want it today. Faith. 